On January 13th, 1846, the Mexican government announced that it would refuse to meet with American minister plenipotentiary John Slidell. Mexican ministers Manuel de la Peña y Peña and Joaquim Marie de Castilla y Lanza had agreed with Secretary of State James Buchanan to receive an American commissioner empowered to settle Mexico's existing grievances with the United States over Mexico's lost territory. Only then would Mexico restore diplomatic relations with the United States. Slidell's mission was to ignore Mexican grievances, demand that Mexico recognize the Rio Grande border, demand it sell New Mexico territories and California to the United States, and pay claims put forward by U.S. citizens. When Slidell arrived in Mexico, Pena refused to meet with him because agreeing to meet would suggest a tacit recognition by Mexico of the American annexation and resolution of the border dispute. Hi, I'm Tom Army, and this is the final part of our three-part series on the Mexican War or the United States Invasion of Mexico. On the same day the Mexican government rejected a meeting with John Slidell, President Polk ordered General Zachary Taylor's forces to march to the Rio Grande. The forces were to take up a defensive position. The President ordered the Navy to blockade the river. Polk attempted to provoke Mexico to war and Slidell performed a charade of diplomacy. Slidell later wrote the Secretary of State, quote, we shall never be able to treat with Mexico until she has been taught to respect us, end quote. The President had another international issue ahead of his problems with Mexico. The United States and Great Britain both claimed the Oregon Territory which included British Columbia. Neither side would give up a square foot of territory. Historian Amy S. Greenberg wrote, quote, to many in the North, full title to Oregon was more clearly America's manifest destiny than was Texas, end quote. Polk's jingoistic rantings about Oregon awakened in Americans a well-developed sense of Anglophobia. Still, with Taylor's men marching through the Nueces Strip, the President realized the potential for simultaneous wars could result in disaster for the young United States. Therefore, President Polk publicly claimed that Oregon belonged to the United States. And privately, he sought a compromise settlement with Great Britain. Both sides saved face and averted a war. Once again, the focus turned to Mexico. In mid-April 1846, General Taylor established a defensive position near the mouth of the Rio Grande, directly across from the fortified port town of Matamoros. He ordered Captain Joseph K. Mansfield to construct an earthen fort, which he named Fort Texas. 500 men garrisoned the fort, including Lieutenant Braxton Bragg's field battery. On April 24, 1846, Mexican General Mariano Arista sent a detachment of cavalry across the river. Taylor sent two small squadrons of mounted troops to investigate. One squadron found nothing. 
but 1,600 Mexican cavalry ambushed the other 80-man force. Word reached Taylor that his troops were either captured or killed. Arista learned from the interrogation of American prisoners that Taylor's main force had moved to Fort Polk on Point Isabel, 23 miles northeast of present-day Brownsville, Texas. They had moved to protect their supply depot. As a result of this new information, on May 3, 1846, Arista ordered the bombardment of Fort Texas as preparation for Mexican forces to take the fort. Four days later, Taylor started his return to Fort Texas with 2,300 men and a 200 wagon supply train. General Arista's army immediately left its camp, intending to block Taylor's efforts to relieve Fort Texas. Mexican General Pedro de Ampudia left for Fort Texas to join Arista. 3,400 Mexican soldiers arrested the movement of Taylor's force about five miles north of the Rio Grande, near Brownsville. The Battle of Palo Alto on May 8th and the Battle of Resaca de la Palma on May 9th proved to be decisive victories for the Americans. Taylor's men fought with skill and bravery. Still, some officers questioned the purpose of their mission. Lieutenant Colonel Ethan Allen Hitchcock, West Point class of 1817, wrote in his diary, we have not one particle of right to be here. It looks as if the government sent a small force on purpose to bring on war, so as to have a pretext for taking California and as much of this country as it chooses. Back in Washington, news of the ambush of the American mounted soldiers, the attack on Fort Texas, and the two subsequent battles would not arrive until May 9th. President Polk had tried to provoke Mexico, but he was losing patience. On April 25th, he told the cabinet the time had come to take a bold course towards Mexico, and that forbearance was no longer either a virtue or patriotic. Mexico had refused to recognize Texas independence, the state's ownership of the Nueces Strip, and the efforts of Minister John Slidell. Mexico had insulted our honor. The president told Slidell privately that he was prepared to declare war on Mexico. The next day, the news of Taylor's actions reached the capital. Polk immediately started work on his war message, asking Congress to recognize that war already existed between the United States and Mexico. Just before the president sent his message to Congress on May 11th, he met with Democratic Senators Lewis Cass and Thomas Hart Benton. Cass praised the message, but Benton told the president that he was willing to vote men and money for defense of our territory, but he was not prepared to make aggressive war on Mexico. Benton's dissent quickly reached Democratic congressional leaders. Consequently, with alacrity and high-handed efficiency, the House leadership bundled the authorization of war funds with Polk's declaration of war. The Democrats limited debate on the measure to just two hours. 
John Quincy Adams of Massachusetts saw the war as an effort to extend slavery and voted no, but only 13 others followed his lead. Many Southern and Western Whigs feared a public backlash and were worried about their reputations, and so they voted yes to war. They wanted to avoid charges of disloyalty. During the War of 1812, the Federalist Party's decision to hold the Hartford Convention led to charges of treachery and betrayal. Eventually, the party collapsed. The Whigs did not want to repeat this experience. The Senate postponed the vote until the next day. Polk and Buchanan were aware that a coalition of Democrats and Whigs could defeat the bill. But on May 12th, after heated debate, the Senate passed the bill 42 to 2. Only Whigs Thomas Clayton of Delaware and John Davis of Massachusetts voted against the war party. John C. Calhoun of South Carolina actually opposed the war. He abstained from voting and protested the incorporation of the northern Mexico territories, saying the United States was a government of the white race. Treating Mexicans as equals would be a grave error. Senator Benton, at first a leading voice against the aggressive actions of his country, agreed in the end. He said, quote, that he was bound to stick with the war party or he was a ruined man, end quote. Later the same day, the president reminded Secretary of State Buchanan in no uncertain terms, quote, that though we had not gone to war for conquest, yet it was clear that in making peace, we would, if practicable, obtain California and such other portion of Mexican territory as would be sufficient." End quote. The war that started with a presidential lie left approximately 12,500 U.S. dead and another 25,000 Mexican soldiers and civilians killed. It ended with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. The Mexican government ceded enormous territory to the United States, including California, Nevada, Utah, and parts of Arizona, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Kansas, Colorado, Wyoming, and Texas. To many Americans, the outcome of the war seemed inevitable. According to the Democratic Illinois State Register, Mexicans were our racial inferiors, but little removed from the Negro. Battlefield victories proved this superiority and sustained nobly the character of the Anglo-Saxon race. Racism and the white man's manifest destiny were part of why we went to war with Mexico in 1846 and refused to acknowledge Mexican Texas. Sadly, Americans moving west often ignored those articles of the peace treaty, which guaranteed the rights of Mexicans and indigenous communities living in the ceded lands. Some Mexicans were not officially given citizenship until decades later. The sectional balance that existed since the 1820 Missouri Compromise would fracture. Congress would immediately take up the question of whether slavery should be allowed to expand into the new territories. The debate was acrimonious. Compromise, eminently difficult. Yet the Compromise of 1850 would not hold. The 1850s saw a series of events all linked to the outcome of the Mexican War. And these events would culminate in a new war. This new cataclysmic war would reshape and remold the century that followed. And today, we still live with the legacy of that war.